I've been catching up with the various party leaders here as we lead up to the uh, campaign launch, and that includes Green Party leader Elizabeth May. She's the longest serving leader of any of the major federal parties. She's been at the helm of the Greens since 2006 and was first elected to the House of Commons in 20, uh, 2011. She was the lone MP elected under the party banner until she was joined earlier this year by Paul Manley, who won a second seat on Vancouver Island for the Greens. Now, if the polls hold up, they could easily uh, build on that seat count, uh, maybe even double their ranks, maybe triple their ranks this time around. But there are still a lot of what ifs. And so I had a chance to talk with Elizabeth May. Here's my conversation with her. Elizabeth May, good to see you again. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. So by my count, this is uh, election number four, federal elect election number four for Elizabeth May as the Green Party leader. What feels different about this one? Just about everything, really. Honestly, Peter, we have the ground shifting under our feet. We have reports from candidates across the country who are experiencing surges of support in places where we, we frankly didn't think we had potential. So we're excited and, and we're being taken far more seriously and, and properly exposed to more scrutiny. And I'm just so looking forward. What do you think is happening? I think it's a combination of a lot of people. A lot of voters are disillusioned with the parties for whom they've always voted. Um, Justin Trudeau let down a lot of people with some large broken promises. Traditional conservatives are not warming to Andrew Scheer. The NDP is losing its hold. And people are beginning to, it's not just by default, they're looking at the Green Party. Plus, the climate crisis, the climate emergency is clearly a matter of critical importance. And we're the party that has the clearest, strongest, most compelling plan to address this so that we can survive it, both as a, as a healthy economy in Canada and for our kids' future. I, I think the conventional political thinking would be, oh, it's, it's because, and you touched on that, some of that, that the, the climate challenge has really come to the forefront here. Yeah. But you're suggesting that it, it's more than that, that it's, it's not, for instance, not just people that are concerned about the environment that might be thinking green now, it's for other reasons as well. I think so. I think the issues around ethics and honesty and who, who, you know, where, what, what party can you really trust? As the other parties break their promises and let down their supporters, uh, the, the fact that I've been around a long time and I'm pretty consistently doing the same thing, which is basically working all the time and answering questions when they're asked as honestly as I can. It's not just me, but the party's record is one right across the country, whether Mike Schreiner in Ontario or Andrew Weaver in British Columbia, David Kuhn in New Brunswick, Peter Bevan Baker in PEI. Those are our provincial leaders who are being elected representing constituents on behalf of the Green Party in legislatures and in Parliament, like Paul Manley from Nanaimo Ladysmith. They make people feel proud because our conduct is held, we hold ourselves to a very high standard. We don't need a set of rules and regulations and punishments to hold ourselves to a high standard of letting our voters know, you know as, as my grandfather would have said, my word is my bond. It's a long time since people felt they could count on people in politics to keep their word. You're the longest serving federal leader uh, in, in this election campaign. Um, how do you think that longevity um, has influenced the relationship you have now with voters. And I guess I'm framing that in such a way that in the early days, and yeah. uh, we've known each other since you were <laughs> in the early days as, as yeah. the Green Party leader, there's a lot of having to go tell people who you are, what your policies are. Yes. Um, how has that changed? Well, I, I sometimes feel, I mean, you, I, pride goeth before a fall and all of that, so I'm, I, I, I guard against anything sure. that, that could get close to sniffing like hubris. But I think the track record is strong of, and, and, and people get to know me as a person. They know that, you know, like for instance, you're never going to hear me say I misspoke. I don't know what a misspeaking is. If I've made a mistake, I'll own up to it. I speak clearly and honestly, and I hope I've got my facts straight. People know with me what you see is what you get, and I think that's bred a certain amount of respect. It certainly is, for me, overwhelmingly uh, touching that when I'm traveling across the country, which I do pretty much every province in the course of a year, I see a lot of Canadians. And so many people stop to thank me, which is extraordinary. I say, well, thanking, what are you thanking me mm. for? They say, I just, I just admire the way you work, and I admire that you're sticking to your principles. I don't know where that goes exactly, and I, it certainly isn't all about me. The Green Party is much stronger than one person. We have so as I said, across the country now, we have 18 elected Greens, and all our volunteers and all our candidates are really so, I mean, they all inspire me. But as people get to know us better, 
I hope that the time I've been working helps establish something of a degree of trust. Does it does it help in, in some ways? Is it you know when you get um, when you get to know a leader? Uh, that's that's often the biggest challenge for people is they 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 may see policies that. Uh, they find they can agree with, but maybe they're not warming to a leader. Yeah. In this case, I mean, let's be honest, it's politics. Some people may never warm to you, but, <laughs> if, but if they are, if they've had a lot of time to get to know who the leader of the Green Party is, yeah. which kind of removes that from the equation of then having to match up a leader with policies. Right? And the, yeah, and the other thing is I, I, I've known and liked the leaders of the other parties with whom I've worked since I've become leader of the Green Party 13 years ago. And one thing I've observed is that the, the if voters have a hard time getting to know the other guys because they're almost uniformly overcoached and scripted and controlled. So the real them doesn't get through at all to voters. I think they're almost sabotaged by their handlers that they, they're so worried about a person making a mistake that they over control. Mm -hmm. as a, as, you know, so I know that, for instance, for debates, people used to ask me the few times I've gotten in debates in the past, well, how did you prepare? And so I just study my fouls. But the others go through this kind of fake play acting, right. and they practice their lines. If well, they say this, you say this. All right. Yeah. So I can watch their brains working while we're while we're in a debate, and I'm, they're waiting for the moment when they can use the zinger line, which means they're not actually listening to the question. They're not fully present. They're over controlled by their handlers. And it makes for, I mean, voters get sick of that. They can tell when someone's on message and when they're honestly answering a question. What are your expectations? What, what's, what's success in this campaign? What will it look like? It'll look like making a difference. It won't be the number of seats we win as a Green Party, because who knows? We, we, we could have a fluke like Jack Layton had in 2011 in Quebec, Pierre Nantel from Langueil, Saint Hubert, Daniel Green's good results in Outremont. I think there's fertile ground in Quebec. It's a very uh, environmentally aware province. And if a wave, we've seen that, if a wave starts to happen in Quebec. You never know. You, know how, you don't, never know how far it'll go. But the number of seats, that if, if it's a minority parliament, we don't know how many seats it would take to make the difference that needs to be made. And that's the difference around responding to the climate emergency while we have time in a way that makes mm -hmm. a difference. So if you hold the balance of power, um, how would you exercise that? I mean, is there anything you've seen now from these other parties that would say, okay, if this, if, for instance, if the Liberals win a minority government, mm -hmm. uh, have they got a climate plan that you would support to keep them in government? Absolutely not. They don't have a climate plan that is the least bit responsive to the nature of this emergency. They have good words and some very good first steps, but unless your target as a country is consistent with the advice from the scientific community of what must be done, and this isn't about politics, this is about physics. We've only got so many years within which we can make a very large correction to our direction. Our, it's not a mid-course correction, it's a late-course correction. But we've got to grab the wheel and turn hard. We've got to move away from going off a cliff that's right in front of us. We can see it, it approaches, and right now we know that to make those kinds of changes, uh, we don't have till 2030. By 2030 is when we have to have essentially globally reduced emissions by about half for Canada to pull our fair share of the weight the Green Party target is 60 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. We have the details for how we can get there. But and all the, fossil fuels completely, right, by 2050? Uh, net zero. Yeah. Net, net, net zero carbon by 2050. In order to meet the demands of science, you can't still have, as the Liberals do, the same target that Stephen Harper left in place in 2015, which is not, it's not only not a good target, it's inconsistent with achieving the goals that are required. So if we end up in a minority parliament and it's a liberal liberal government and a minority mm -hmm. parliament, you're you're and you may hold the balance of power and you you yeah, your 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 offer to them will be uh, bringing a throne speech with with promises of way more on climate change or we'll have an election. Or to any of the parties, we talk to all of them. But the reality is depending on how how Canadians vote. This is an election which, ironically, by the way, I think it was amazing. We, we were told in, throughout 2015 that uh, 2015 would be the last election held under first past the post. Obviously, that was one of Justin Trudeau's more, more spectacular. It wasn't really a broken promise. It was a betrayal. But because we're going to have six parties returning to Parliament at the end of this election, it's increasingly likely, and why you're asking the question, that it could be a minority mm -hmm. Parliament. This Parliament could end up looking very much like one where we had had fair voting. So if every Canadian gets out to vote, and this is my plea with everyone, vote, 
and vote for what you want. If you like, if you like the policies of Andrew Scheer, if you like Max Bernier's policies, if you like Justin Trudeau's policies, Jagmeet Singh's, vote for what you want. This is one election where we can't afford for people to be cagey or strategic. So you're, you're saying if people think it could be a conservative minority, uh, don't, don't not vote green because of that and throw your supports behind liberals, for instance. Right. Vote for what you want. Vote for what you want because this is an election where more than likely we're going to be looking at a minority situation. And in that, then you have to look at what do what do Canadian how have they expressed their views? How many of the parties that receive the most support express at least intentions that are good around climate? And then we say, who's prepared to bring in a plan that ensures our kids will have a livable world by the time they're our age? And of course, I'm older than the others, but let's just say by the time our kids are 65, will they have a livable world? And if you're not prepared to commit to that, I'm afraid, my friend that you won't get support even on the speech from the throne. All right, Elizabeth May, always great to talk to you. Thanks. Thanks, Peter.